you, Mary Harrington, like Frodo, want to carry the ring uh, all the way to the fires <laughs> of Mount Doom and destroy a power that is dehumanizing us all. You know, the Occupy Wall Street movement failed because it didn't realize just how far we needed to go. And I think pro- before we can have an Occupy Wall Street movement, we need an Occupy Ourselves movement. And that, that has to start with women. We are our bodies. We are our bodies. Hello, I'm Glenn Scrivener from Speak Life. We see all things through the lens of Jesus. And today we've got a very special guest, Mary Harrington, uh, whose new book is just out. It's called Feminism Against Progress. And uh, Mary joins me on the line. Mary, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Glenn. What have you got against progress, Mary? (laughs) Progress is great. You seem like a lovely person. and, (laughs) And yet you're taking aim at this transcendent ideal in our culture. What have you got against progress? Well, it's not... Well, it's not so much that I have something against progress as that I lost my faith in progress. I don't believe in it. Um, And I'll I'll, I'll try and unpack that for you a little bit. It is my view that what we understand as progress um, is is much... only looks progressive if you you narrow your terms so much that you can't see the costs. And that in in most cases, what what it is in practice is a set of technologies that free us from what previously looked like natural limits to what we can do. You know, we can make water run uphill or we can make, we can genetically engineer animals or, you know, we can interrupt the relationship between um, sex and reproduction or etc. You know, a thousand and one ways that we can, that we can liberate ourselves from, from previously natural seeming limits. And most of those come under the rubric of progress. A great deal, great many of them. Um, have impacted women in very immediate ways. Um, I lost my faith in progress um, as a result of some sort of personal biographical things that all happened at once in my late 20s, um, where, without without boring you with the details of what happened to me, I just came came to think, came to see this this entire theology, and I see it straightforwardly as a theology, which is sort of spun out of uh, Christian relatively recent um, Christian past and, and which is sort of it's, sort of, it, it, it's like somebody's taken a belt sander to Christianity and taken off any of the difficult bits and just left us with the idea that things can things can and should go on getting better forever right. and generally speaking when people when people want to cite evidence of progress they will take sort of belt sanded Christian values and point to the ways technology has got us closer to those values <laughs> it is my view that generally speaking, those those points are only provable if you leave out the ways in which things have got worse at the same time. Um, and and by that, to be clear, I don't mean I don't mean that I'm I'm an anti-progressive. I don't, I don't think the world is going to hell in a handcart. You know, I don't think the inverse is true. I just don't, I just think, in in moral terms, we exist in something in in this life. We exist in something more like a steady state, and it's not actually possible to 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 attain heaven on earth. I don't. I, and so and so when you when you see. And yet this idea of progress is just in the water. It's so pervasive that even even supposedly conservative um, think tanks or political parties or whatever will just routinely give themselves names that suggest moving forward rather than going backwards. You know, it's, it's invariably about onward or, or, or refresh or reframe or revitalize. Things can or, only get better. Things yeah. can only get better. Yeah, I think the peak progress to my eye was somewhere between 1995 and 2008, the Great Crash, <laughs> which was the year of my personal Great Crash, the year I lost my faith in progress. Um, which was, yeah, it was a devastating experience, which had personal components and also sort of macro political components. And I'd say it took me a solid seven years of reading and thinking to rebuild something like a functioning worldview or way of relating to other people after that. And yeah, I won't, I won't bore your listeners with, with my personal journey, but it's a, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a real, it was a real recovery story. You know, losing your faith in progress is, is to lose your entire matrix for for how how and why the world and how and why me in the context of the world and i imagine i i I dare say that i dare say people who lose a a a more explicitly religious faith you know find themselves very much adrift in very much the same way so i came out the other side of that um realizing that there were there were commitments i still had um despite the fact that i didn't believe in progress and one of those was really one of those was a thorny problem to solve because yeah, for again, for personal biographical reasons, I've I've always taken an interest in feminism, in women's issues, which I think are often marginalised in public conversation, and women's women's interests are often very materially and sometimes quite violently marginalised in in the world, um, for for concrete embodied reasons. Um, 
which then get which then get worked out and elaborated through the culture in all sorts of different ways. And, and but I, I really wrestle with this because feminism is very difficult to unpick from the sort of progress theology. You know, in in the way in the way that we grapple with the question of women and how women relate to public life and so on, um, it's it's extremely difficult to to unravel to to disaggregate it from from progress. So I so I spent I spent a solid seven to ten years thinking: Is it still possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? Um, because I mean, you know, just to to put it very simply, you know, if you ask people to give you evidence of progress, most of them will will say, well. Well, you know, do you, would you really want to be a woman in the Middle Ages with no legal personhood and, you know, effectively the chattel property of your husband? And I'd be like, well, no. And they'd be like, there you go, ha, ah, progress. So, <laughs> so you do believe in progress after all. There you go, gotcha. And and the and I and I sat there thinking, I was, well, yeah, I don't, I actually don't think that's a gotcha. I think it's much more complicated than that. And that's an, and then I also had a child, which left me thinking about it and much thinking about the question of women and feminism and sex roles and how we got to where we got to in a very concrete way, because I was right down there in the weeds, um, pushing a buggy around the deserted small town streets of, um, of Middle England. Right. And they were deserted. Yet they were deserted because everybody else was back back to work after two weeks of maternity leave. Well, and... in, in in Britain we don't go back to work after two weeks, mercifully. You know, it's not where it's you know the maternity policies are not as barbarous as they are in the United States, where the, there is no mandated maternity availability. You know, here here you you get you, you get six months statutory as a statutory right, and then you can take a further six months unpaid, which most mothers do, um, unless they absolutely can't afford to. Um, and yet, after that time, um, our, our babies were still babies, and there was absolutely no. You know, I was I was incredibly fortunate to have the choice. I mean, I also didn't like work very much, and there was no, there was nothing I could imagine doing for money that that was in anywhere near as appealing as, um, you know, it would in any way compensate for not being not being there for my daughter. So, so I didn't go back to work because I didn't have to. Yes, and even the language. Yeah, the language we use about that is the language of motherhood penalty. Yeah, it's a punishment. It's 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 treated at best an inconvenience or an obstacle, and at worst, you know, straight up a punishment. You know, the, the motherhood penalty. You know, this is something we suffer from. This is a burden or a misfortune. Um, and and I I just didn't really. Again, I was lucky. You know, I, I was extraordinarily privileged to be to have the choice because choice in this context is. Um, just not not really available for a lot of people who, for economic reasons, just have to. A lot of mothers who economic you you need both parents working because otherwise you know, the otherwise you know, you get your house repossessed. That's that's not that's no choice. Yeah, and that brings us to the um, the the market side of things um, because if you consider motherhood to be a penalty, what you're really saying is the great reward. Is to be able to devote yourself to a career, or you know, in in today's economy, multiple, uh, very fragile and unstable careers, and that is first best, and everything else takes a back seat to that. Um, so you you write um, against kind of the free market and against and 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 you see you see the negative sides of industrialization. Can you can you? Take us through that that economic side of things. Sure, I mean, going going all the way all the way back to the beginning of the sort of progress era, which is to say the beginning of modernity and the industrial era, um, we've we've taken you know, the, the the sort of governing paradigm for what a person is. I was recently pulled up by some anthropologists for calling this an anthropology. So, so let's call it a paradigm for what a person is. Um, the, gov- the, the governing paradigm for, within modernity for what a person is is somebody is separate by default. Um, you know, and connection is something which which we can opt into. Um, and this is, you know, I mean, you you, you find this in Rousseau, um, all the, you know, all, all the way back to Rousseau, and you know, I think there are there are liberal thinkers. And you, you find it in Hobbes, you find it in Locke. You know, this this idea that the state of nature is something radically isolated, and radically atomized, and radically competitive and mutually hostile. You know, the Hobbesian war of all against all. You know, different different theorists um, have different ideas for how what we do about that. But the basic assumption is that we're all we're all radically separate by default, and coming together is something is is something which which we hope will happen on top of that. Now, this is all very well if you're a guy, but if you're a mother, it's just not true. Or it's certainly not true in the same way. And Rousseau was that Rousseau kind of said the quiet part out loud a long time ago on this. He explicitly excluded. 
women from his vision of liberal personhood. I mean, the, the what he proposed for women didn't, is, did, frankly didn't sound very appealing. You know, he thought of us as kind of charming, compliant support humans who were there to kind of pop out babies and generally be nice and and raise and raise raise the the children of the real liberal subjects. Um, you know, needless to say, a lot of feminists since then have had a few things to say about that and like, well, no, this is obviously nonsense. Um, you know, obviously women are human, um, but. It's much rarer, it's much more common for feminism to question the idea that women should have access to that default state of liberal personhood than for it is to women to say, well, if this, if this default state of liberal personhood doesn't apply to, to women, you know, is surely that's, surely that's not a problem with women, that's a problem with, with the paradigm. And that's, that's a much, <laughs> that's a much less common way of approaching it. And yet, and, and, and the, and the upshot of that is that, um, we've, for most of the history of the Industrial Revolution, we've ended up in a situation where there's been a real, very lively, very rich and complex back and forth among women, you know, in terms, firstly, of how we respond to the technological changes of the Industrial Revolution and how those impact on family life. And secondly, on how we make sense of what women are as people in that context. And, you know, just to put it very crudely, I mean, effective, I mean, the, the, the critical change here is that work moved out of the home with the industrial, with the industrial era. And so, whereas, whereas in the Middle Ages, most at working, most adults, indeed, most, most children older than about five would work in proportion to their abilities, you know, in the context of a productive household, which is to say, you know, the household conceived of as the basic economic unit, you know, whether that's a cottage, uh, an artisan or, a, or an agrarian or some mixture of the two. But after industrialization, work moves out into these complex, expensive, sometimes quite remote factories with heavy machinery, which is dangerous. And you know, obviously in that context, you can't, you can't easily bring a breastfed baby with you um, or, or keep an eye on toddlers who, who, who are going to get sort of, yeah, you, who, who are not going to be, who can't be left safely running around enormous, dangerous did they, machines. Did they dope them with opioids? Is that, is that something that, that Marx reports, happens? if you read Marx on the industrial era, he reports mothers do- you know, giving their children opioids, giving their babies opioids to pacify them while they did 12-hour shifts in the factories. Um, and all, 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 all manner of other sort of horrible, horrible ways that people in dire economic necessity mothers in dire economic necessity coped with having to leave their children behind because work and home were no longer um no, were no longer the same thing and they had to they had to do what they had to do to survive and um, it it makes it makes for some pretty grim reading um so so this is so really this is the situation this is the original situation which feminism as we understand it is trying to deal with you know how or even if you can be a mother in the context where work and home are not the same thing anymore and and as I've in my reading of what happened next, you know, there were two there were two sort of characteristic responses. Obviously, there's a huge amount of nuance depending on where and how and what pace and local context. But broadly speaking, um, some women said, well, you know, we, we have this much reduced role as sort of, quote unquote, the angel of the household now. Um, and and that's good, actually. You know, we should we we should we should value and appreciate the things that non that no longer no, so women are no longer economically productive they're no longer you know working members of a productive household instead and and so effectively they lost economic agency you know they lost economic leverage at the beginning of the industrial era which which i found quite a counterintuitive um thing to contemplate especially given most of the sort of pop histories of women that you hear will 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 treat us as economically radically disempowered from the beginning of time all up until the point where women entered the workplace in the mid twentieth century, and when I but when I look at well when I look at what actually happened, that's not true. It's only really true, you know, and even then only partially from the beginning of the industrial era, which is the point where bourgeois women who could afford to retreated into the home because it's in in essence they felt they they preferred to you know given the choice between having to care for given the choice between caring for children who obviously still needed it. And who most women rightly understood still needed care, and um, being economically productive, you know, those who could afford to, much as I did when I when I became a stay-at-home mum, you know, chose the latter. You know, they they, they chose they chose to they chose to look after their children. But obviously, this comes with downsides, especially in a in a world where you you, you still can't legally own property, and which which retains a lot of the legal and social um, legacy baggage from an era when women and men were both economic. Both had economic agency in a productive household, so they found women women in that situation found themselves radically disempowered. 
um, in a way which, which in the Middle Ages, arguably for most women, hadn't actually been the case um, because they'd been they'd been pulling their weight economically as well as um, um, in, in in a caring capacity. So yeah, I, and, and to, to me, this is a the, the, this is this is the crucible out of which feminism emerged. So on the one hand, you have you have the women who say, well, actually, what we need to do is make sure everybody values the caring domain, the domestic domain, and this and so this produces the so-called cult of domesticity, which is a, a, a great many, large, mostly bourgeois women who wrote prolifically and produced they produced women's magazines and sort of morality stories and in you know huge amounts of pamphlets on education and moral upbringing of children and the the virtues of of the domestic realm and really what they were doing was saying this is this is a new world that we're in but here are the ways that it matters still even if in fact we don't have direct economic clout anymore but then on the other hand um it, that's a risky situation to be in because you still effectively are radically disempowered. And so the, the cult of, you know, the domesticity is good actually only really works as long as you have a good relationship with your husband and enough funds. You know, if your husband is a, is a drunk or beats you or, you know, any, any one of the other ways that a, a relationship can unfortunately sometimes go wrong, uh, you have a problem because you can't leave. You can't, you have no right to take, you have no custody rights over your children. You can't, you, you can't work. Um, and so that that in turn sort of gave gave the impetus to the other feminism, which is the feminism of freedom. And so on the one hand, you have women who are who are pushing for a valorization of care, the domain of interdependence and um, the the tending of infants and the elderly and the all those things, all those spaces outside the market, which women rightly recognized were still important, still hugely significant, and which had historically been women's domain. And then on the other hand, you have women saying no. Actually, what we need is to enter the market, you know, which is to say, the enter the market on the same terms as men, and and so that that propels that propels a whole a whole second um, tranche of feminism, which to my eye, you know, and really the end of that story is in the it is with the sexual revolution, where that where that version of feminism won, definitively. Yes, very much to the point where we can't really look back at nineteenth century, eighteenth century expressions of feminism. Yeah, absolutely. Most of them don't read. Yeah, most of them don't read as such. And this yeah. is what I found so fascinating. I remember the, my my whole disappearing down this rabbit hole emerged from a from, from a sort of lengthy argument I had with a friend who said feminism started with Alexandra Kollontai, who was a Marxist in early twentieth century Marxist feminist, and and I. I and I said, no, that's that's absolute nonsense. That's not true at all. You're completely ignoring an entire body of work during the 19th century. It made me really angry. And I ended up having to write the whole first third of the book just to explain just to explain why this is wrong. <laughs> yeah, and much needed because we look back at th- things like the temperance movement mm. and we, we think of that as just regressive and reactionary in, yes. in, in a very negative sense. Yes. Well, why, but it's feminist. How, it's, it's, femi- yes. it's straight up. It's yeah. feminism. It's just not legible as feminism in the context of the subsequent... Because they really need their men not to drink their wage yeah. earnings and yeah, yeah, beat yeah, the kids. Yeah. They yeah. really need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a feminist yeah, it, it, cause. It's not, it's not rocket science. You know, sober, yeah. so, sober non-violent husbands is self <laughs> Yeah. Ah, but Mary, it's restrictive. It's restrictive, so it must be bad. Right, it's, and you know. and, and this, is the, this is what makes it so difficult, because it's you don't realise until you start going down the rabbit hole just how much of what of the the, his, the subsequent historiography of the women's movement is is written in terms of the side that won, which is the feminism of freedom. Um, and 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 so and in the context of that, I mean, his, you know, the winner, his, the winners always write the history books, and and it's only really by by reading sideways through previous, through either reading the feminist historiographers sideways or really sort of disappearing down some strange rabbit holes, in in the works that came previously, um, and being being willing to be surprised by what you find there. That 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 the the contours of of the other the other perspective or you know the multiple other perspectives become a little bit clearer. So really, I mean, this is long story short. You know, I ended up doing this sort of I, I suppose it's kind of crypto Marxist reread of the whole history of the women's movement in terms of material, in term in terms of the material context that produced it, and also in terms of the the interplay between that material context and 
the it, the legacy cultural conditions and the way the way those cultural conditions have those those the the means to use a, a crude reductive term you know the, the sort of cultural interpretations of those material conditions have evolved over the course of time and the conclusion i've come to is that we're now taking with us into a new era the post sexual revolution era which i think of as the cyborg era a set of a set of beliefs about what progress looks like, specifically in the context of women, which are now ex- increasingly obviously anti-women. Yes, let's let's think about the sexual revolution, and then we'll then we'll discuss cyborg theocracy. You, <laughs> you've, got, you've got the best phrases. You've got the best phrases, Mary. They're awesome. But so, like my 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 sort of thumbnail sketch of the sexual revolution is that really 1900 years before. Uh, the 1960s, we had this sexual revolution that you know Kyle Harper writes about in his wonderful book from from shame to sin, um, or you can look at Joseph Hendrick uh, when he talks about the weirdest people in the world. He basically says the church reached down and grabbed men by the testicles, and basically demanded that men be as restricted in their sexual expression as women had always been expected to, and so there was a there was a real equalizing impetus. In the sexual revolution of the first centuries, the, the that Jesus revolution, what we saw and and absolutely technologically enabled via the pill, is in the 1960s we we got an equalization of the sexes in the other direction, so that women were told to be as let's say liberated as men had always been able to be, and then expected to have a, a, the the same kinds of sexual proclivities and, and same kind of attitudes to sex and relationships that men had always had, and here we are. Uh, and it's it's equal in one in one sense but it's it's in that liberation kind of uh, vein and yeah tell, t- tell us what the result of that has been well so let's see so the I, I stick a pin in the the sexual revolution by which um, I don't actually make this point in the book because it's sort of come become clearer to me since I finished writing it but it I stick a pin in the sexual revolution because I think it's important to understand that it wasn't, you know, what we think of as, you know, a revolution in some, something relatively, relatively trivial, you know, that doesn't impact the sort of meet the, the the majority of our lives, which is to say our sexual behaviour. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a trivial thing. In fact, it was, it wasn't the sexual revolution. It was a transhumanist revolution, which is to say the point at which we we left behind the idea that humans have a nature and embraced a paradigm for medicine or medical technology, if you like, more broadly, that that sees human nature as something amenable to being improved and potentially limitless, limitless, limitlessly upgraded. And the you know, when, when we think of when when somebody says transhumanism, you know, the the, the picture we'll, we'll have in mind might be sort of you know humans with with robotic components or you know something out of science fiction. But but it's important to understand that the the reality is much more banal, um, you, and almost all and the reason you know almost all women are transhumanists because almost all women you know think it's perfectly fine to use the pill. Now the pill was the first transhumanist technology because it didn't set out it wasn't a medicine that set out to cure normal healthy functioning. It set out to interrupt it in the name of personal freedom. I mean, in, in the sense you know the 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 pill the pill is good not because it makes you better but because it it, it breaks it. It, it 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 disables. Yeah, it dis- it disables. Yeah. It, yeah. it makes something which previously seemed natural be- optional, mm. and so so you know what what was previously a normal healthy state of fertility becomes something you can switch on and off, and as Abigail Val puts it um, in, the, in the Genesis of Gender, um, it's you know, and the, the default setting is off. Right. Um, so so just to prov- to provide that bit of background to what we're calling the sexual revolution, which are you, hmm. let's call it the cyborg revolution. Okay. Um, but what that what that brought with it, and um, where this relates to feminism, is it, it brought with it, it definitively um, it definitively defeated the feminism of interdependence in favour of the feminism of freedom, because it set as a basic premise, you know, it, it it gave women access to liberal personhood on the same atomized terms as men, but the cost was a permanent permanent dependence on a technology. And thus, effectively, permanent dependence on the market. So, I mean, for, in, in that sense, you can see you, you you can see it as the entry of the point, the definitive point of entry of capitalism into women's bodies. Um, and but but and, and that but that wasn't framed as um, 
a moment of liberation. It wasn't framed as a moment of invasion or colonization or exploitation. It was framed as freedom. And this is a pattern that I've seen repeated in an infinite, an ad infinitum since. The entry of capitalism further and further into the human body, um, but framed not as exploitation, but as liberation. And for the most part, people take that at face value. Um, and I think the, and I mean, that, that will, I, I imagine in due course, bring us on to questions of human nature and whether or not there is even such a thing. But from, from the point of view of the cyborg paradigm, there is no such thing as human nature. Um, there, there, are, there are simply there are observable patterns which we're entitled to interrupt or upgrade if they get in the way of our desire. So, so, so this is, so, so, so this is the, the moment of the sexual revolution. And to my eye, that moment of the, of the colonization of women's bodies by capital yeah, has, has set off, you know, it sets women constitutively at odds with our own bodies, you know, that, as the price of liberal emancipation um, in, in ways which have been played out. I, I, in the book, I've unpacked three, three large scale patterns of what I call the war on relationships, which is to say though it, it wages war on the relationships between men and women which had previously been governed to a degree, and you know, for better or for worse, by an understanding of asymmetry and of some interdependence. It sets off a, relation, a war on the relationship between mothers and babies because, the, because natural, normal fertility is interrupted and increasingly commodified. And downstream of that, you start to see the component parts of fertility being broken down and further commodified, for example, in the marketization of gametes or the, the incursions of the fertility industry into the business of reproduction and even the disassembly of gestation and motherhood um, through the commercial surrogacy industry. Um, and, 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 and then finally, we start to see it in the war on relationships between, between ourselves and our own bodies. And this isn't just confined to women. This is this is a logical extension of the turning inward of capital into to, into the human body and the the enclosure and commodification of the human body that start, that begins with the transhumanist turn in the sixties. Um, and and we perhaps I think the most sort of culturally contentious instance of that at the moment is the the transgender activists, the transgender movement, you know, people who claim the right to remodel their bodies as they see fit in line with their inner felt sense of self. And it's, it's particularly contentious where, the, where it concerns children. Um, I've, 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 dis I've discussed this at some length in the book, but to my eye, this is continuous with and extends much further into um, the enclosure and commodification of the human body to the point where, and, uh, and, I, and I think the the driving force is is much is is in is to much deep much more deeply strange places fundamentally this the 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 those who would commodify the human body don't really care about people who feel that their gender and their bodies are misaligned they don't really care about that if they did if they did they would treat people who detransition with as much compassion as they treat people who want to transition they would treat people who are going back the other way towards embodiment with the same right. generosity and the same care but they don't and this is this is because, um, in my view, you to to seek a greater degree of of connection with your own body is to blaspheme against against the basic belief that we're radically dissociated from our bodies and thus entitled to remodel them as as we will. And really, the end point of this, as I've seen it, is the fantasy that you see from some transhumanists that will be able to upload pure consciousness into the cloud or into some other form of. Um, de, de, de bodiless storage system, and and against that, the world that that the flesh left behind can we can just do what we want with it. Right. Um, hence, you hence. call it meat Lego gnosticism. Meat, meat Lego gnosticism. <laughs> <laughs> Love, it. Um, Love it. Did that come to you in the shower one day? Um, did, did you? Th I've got to write that down. Meat Lego gnosticism. Well, it, I think I, I I coined meat Lego just because that that seems it, it's it's a suit. It's an appropriately grotesque formulation for something for what i see of as a basic and really really unpleasant category error which is to say human bodies have an integrity they have a wholeness and people grasp this instinctively you know and little children can see it you know there's a gestalt human form and this is something that we've that which that that human cultures have tended to recognize you know as far back as you care to mention until re well until relatively recently where we started to see and and to me the idea that we can cut off parts and you sort of cut and paste parts of ourselves onto different bodies, you know, take out some bits and replace them with other bits or re remodel that flesh. It's as absurd 
as 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 imagining that humans are made of Lego because we're we're not. You know, the whole thing is a the, the whole human organism is a holistic system with developmental pathways and you know infinitely complex sets of endocrine systems and you know neurological systems and so on that 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 come together in an extraordinary harmony to make up our embodied selves. Um, and this and this idea that you can you can treat that as as Lego parts to be assembled and disassembled seems to be not just grotesque but very asymmetrically grotesque, because while it it may be appealing to the kind of people who can buy and sell parts, who can buy parts to to replace the ones which that are failing in their own bodies or to upgrade parts of themselves that they feel are inadequate, it's another thing altogether if you're selling. Yeah, or where are you sourcing the body parts from? Where are you, it just so, where are you sourcing the body parts from? Yeah, much the same way as um, being liberated to work in the uh, being liberated into the workplace is great if your if your probable career path is lawyer or, or high flying or high court judge. It's another thing altogether if you're being emancipated from your own children so that you can go and put packets through a scanner all day. And um, there's an unspoken class dimension to most of these forms of transhumanist emancipation, which I think is, is woefully under-discussed and merits a great deal more feminist attention that, uh, than at present, I think it receives. So it's meet Lego Gnosticism. So Gnosticism is, uh, I guess we, we kind of piece together Gnosticism from a, a lot of the sort of the early church theologians who are um, wrestling with forms of Christianity that are not embodied, not embedded, where in, in a sense the word doesn't become flesh in that, that sense of uh, the way John's gospel begins, Christ is the, the word who was there from before the beginning, who became flesh and dwelt among us, who became man, who is man, who gives a, a, a sense of an anchoring of uh, of God's life to human life and a dignity and an elevation to human life and embodied life. He rose again in a body. Um, he remains bodily forever. We have bodily futures in, in sort of Orthodox Christianity. But there, there were many sects that um, they would have Gnostic Gospels, for instance, like the Gospel of Thomas, in which Jesus doesn't do anything. There are no events because it's not about events. It's about um, Jesus, the dispenser of wisdom, who can make you the pneumaticoi. He can make you the spiritual ones uh, because n naturally we are flesh ones. Yuck. Ugh. Um, but through wisdom, we can ascend into a, a kind of a form of divinity that escapes embedded, embodied physicality. Um, and that, that was sort of a Gnosticism that was really enemy number one um, for a lot of the early church, like Irenaeus, for instance, and, and um, those early, so we're thinking from about 200, 300, um, that, that period of church history uh, was really taking aim at uh, forms of thinking that deprivilege the physical and the embodied, and you're saying Gnosticism is back. Well, I don't. I, you could probably argue that it never really went away. In the, I mean, my 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 late lamented friend Wendy Wheeler um, sees the entire trajectory of science that's have emerged since Francis Bacon as fundamentally Gnostic in character. You know, there are. If you want to, you can you find just if you're not careful, you find yourself find you know, seeing Gnosticism everywhere. A little bit like some people end up seeing Marxism everywhere, and I think that's probably a mistake. I I use the term, well, I, I I should probably distinguish what I'm calling Gnosticism a bit from the the ancient Gnostic heresy, which was suppressed by the Albigensian Crusade. Um, but what it shares with that doctrine is a fundamental revulsion. At the flesh, at embodiment, a fundamental sense that there's we would we would be better if we weren't um, if we weren't in in hoc to our leaking, seeping, evolved. Uh, I mean, Elise Bohan, um, uh, who is a, a an historian of transhumanism and an advocate for transhumanism, um, put it I think very very evocatively in her books Future Superhuman, which I recommend to anybody who's interested in um, a, a positive case for, for many of the things I argue against. Um, she's, a, she's a very engaging writer and an interesting thinker. Um, and she uses the phrase ape-brained meat sack to describe our bodies. And I think that captures something of the bait of the <clears throat> that we're talking about here. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think, I think this is, there are a number of ways that we should distinguish what, what we're looking at now 
these this this longing this especially dig- digitally enabled longing to escape the flesh from the ancient gnostic heresy um, there, there are lots of, there are lots of ways it's very different but but one of the things it has in common is that basic sense that that the flesh is is malign it's hostile it's it's our enemy and i think i believe that some of the gnostics thought it was that, that the flesh was created by a malign demiurge it was to trap us, to trap us in a in a lower state of, of of existence of mind. Where I think, uh, but I think one of the important distinctions, as I'm between the 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 old Gnostics and the the meat Lego Gnostics, if you like, is as I understand it, the ancient Gnostics were were heavily influenced by Plato, in the sense that they believed that there was a higher dimension, there was a higher realm, and that in fact what they were trying to do was to acquire enough spiritual wisdom to be able to escape this uh, dimension of matter into the higher realm of you know, some, something like Plato's realm of forms. You know, and they, they believed that that was where we belonged and they yearned to be back in that, that, that in higher, pure, in, in the one, the higher, purer, more, more authentic um, reality where, where things were perfect and not just ugly demiurge copies of, of what actually is. So they, so they thought that reality exists. The meat Lego Gnostics don't. They've, they, pretty, they, they, their entire paradigm forecloses the idea that there is such a thing as a world of forms. You know, in fact, their, their, their entire MO relies on there being no, no such place. I mean, if you look at what the transhumanists are doing, they're, they're, it wages war on the idea of human nature. And human nature is, is, is a very crude sort of um, popular, you know, sort of pop term for essentially, you know, the, the idea that there is such a thing as an ideal man. You know, which if it if it exists, exists in, in something like the Platonic world of forms. And if 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 your entire your entire worldview is premised on being able to to over to to soup to defeat that 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 normative human form in order to to reshape reality in accordance with your own desire, then it, it stands to reason that you just you don't believe that such thing exists, or or in fact, you know, if it does exist, you're hostile to it. So, so in that sense, I think I think that's that's a very important distinction to understand, and and there's also and the, the second distinction I would make between the the ancient Gnostics and the and the meat Lego Gnostics is that the second distinction I would make is that the the, the meat Lego version of Gnosticism is structurally dependent on the persistence of what it's waging war on. You know, it's a very paradoxical and very unhappy state of affairs. You know, even even the people who believe that they're going to be able to upload themselves into the cloud and therefore transcend reality are still presuming the persistence of data centers, which implies you know, huge, huge undersea data cables and reliable power stations. And who's going to manage all of that? We don't know. Um, somebody somebody's going to be uploaded into the cloud, but somebody somebody is going to have to do periods of you know yes, what happens the uploading. Yeah, yeah, yeah somebody's going to have to yeah. do the uploading and you know even even data centers need somebody to to mm. to mm. switch them off and then on again on, on occasions so <laughs> hopefully not off but yeah <laughs> yes so but yeah but so 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 the meat the meat lego gnostics are they're, they're immensely powerful in in i mean it's a it's a worldview which has considerable traction in very well funded corners of Silicon Valley and and has has increasing reach via the effective altruism movement which is in deeply interwoven with deep, deeply interwoven with the the transhumanist movement with the um yes yeah, yeah. With, with with the meat leg Gnosticism yeah and and it's all profoundly christian mary like and, like and in, it is. In, in, it in is. terms of the there are these sort of heretical forms of christianity i would say that that are kind of uh, you know this is this is the water that we swim in i listened to your debate with um uh elise bowen and it did occur to me that whenever she was talking about the flesh actually her most persuasive rhetorical move was to talk about our um, our finitude and and our mortality, and and at that stage, talking about you know we we have so much more to experience of life. Um, the idea that the the the, the sands of the hours, uh, hourglass of time are, are running out and confronting our mortality is something we want to transcend, isn't it? And I, I thought at that stage she was kind of. Um, she was tapping into something quite Christian at that point because a, an ancient person would, would actually just think, well, your progeny is the way to gain immortality, actually. Sure. As opposed to some kind of post-death 
survival, resur- it wasn't a resurrection because uh, the flesh is a meat sack. <laughs> and so the, she's tapping into something kind of profoundly Christian about our, our desire for, for hope. And you're tapping into something profoundly Christian in terms of our embodied, embedded life lives um, that are kind of to be lived. But do you see something to that, that, that sort of we're, we're, all, we're all being shaped by some, some Christian-ish mm. presuppositions that are going back and forwards? I think that's absolutely true. And I, I mean, I, th- I would say I'd say the Christian-ish influences in the transhuman movement go, go considerably further than that. I mean, you're, it's, it's, difficult, it's difficult to see, it's difficult to make a positive case for genetically en- editing human embryos that doesn't that doesn't both offend greatly against Christianity, but also rely on some of its basic assumptions. I mean, it, it's a it's it, on on the one hand, it's blasphemous because you're 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 playing God. But on the other hand, if you're doing it because you think you're going to relieve suffering, you're also very much in hock to to the to the values which you're you're busy undermining in pursuit of your own goals. And this this is the thing I find I find most striking about. About the, these are these arguments is the extent to which, in order to work, they have to they have to attack the fundamentally Christian understanding of what a person is, um, you know, as, as something you know, as as an individual, but you know, created in the image of God and you know, possessing a, a natural innate dignity, and you know, and and to whom you know, in every in the in the case of every person, we owe a sort of basic basic effort to to treat them as we would be as we would like to be treated you know that's that to, to put it very i mean you could that in in essence um the transhumanist argument says we have to attack that that image of our of humans as we, we have to attack the understanding of humans as made in the image of god and we have to consider the possibility that we might like to upgrade ourselves with i don't know more legs or um not even a body at all if necessary and we're, but we're going to do it in the name of um, treating others as we'd like to be treated ourselves, for example, by relieving suffering, um, and so what? And so, really, what they're doing is that they're, they're sitting on a very Christian branch in, and, and busily sawing it off um, underneath themselves <laughs> in order in order to attain their goals. And I suppose, and I think one of the one one of the most um, powerful and I think and thought provoking questions in that debate came from somebody who said, "Well." What's what precisely is there to stop people who have the power to do these things from do from ordering that power to a completely different set of values? And to me, that seems like the great unanswered question. I mean, once you once you have the I think Paul Virilio, um, the French cultural critic, and also actually a devout Catholic, um, points out I think very very insightfully that the moment you the moment you have the power to create Superman, you also have the you you, you also have the power to create subhumans. Mm-hmm. Right, um, it's yeah, the, the ring. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's Tolkien's ring. You know, <laughs> just so, yeah. just so. I yeah. mean, you, you, the, the moment, the moment you've enhanced some people, you've abjected the rest. Yeah, um, yeah. He, he he calls this super racism. You know, a sense that a sense of racism that isn't just racism against other other ethnicities within the overall human species, but a proliferation of human species, plural, such that racism is no longer against my own kind. You know. But against just a, a, a different species altogether, you know, which, which is which is really a difference. You know, that's that's a that's a profound difference. Yes, yeah, and it reminds me of uh, C.S. Lewis's *The Abolition of Man*. So, you know, after I read your book over the weekend, I went back to *The Abolition of Man*, and he's got so many comments just like that. He says, "What we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men." over other men mm-hmm. with nature as its instrument. Yes. Or he says, for the power of man to make himself what he pleases means the power of some men to make other men what they please. Yes, and, and returning returning to the, the meat Lego Gnostics and what this what this how this potentially or even actually already in practice turns out looking like. I mean you can you can see you can see for example the difference between the way Paris Hilton is able to use, you know, for, former it girl Paris Hilton um, who's now just, I think, I believe she's had one or possibly more children via surrogacy. So she's paid somebody else to do the gestating for her. And she has, I believe, something like 20 embryos on ice, but she's waiting for a, but, but she's going to carry on creating embryos in petri dishes until she gets one of the sex that she desires. Wow. Um, and so that's, that's Paris Hilton, who has turned the creation of human lives into something like choosing a new handbag. And that's that's at one end of the economic scale, and then at the other end of the economic scale, looking at how what happens when we disassemble the component parts of fertility, you have 
you 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 have women for example in 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 less in developing countries who are pressured by economic urgency or their families to 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 take work as gestational surrogates and only to find themselves ostracized from their communities having done so or even you find women who are compelled to undergo a hysterectomy in order to make themselves more employable and you know and you only really have to think about the the existing trade in human internal organs um and the occasional news we get that somebody is going to attempt the transplant of a uterus into a human male who desires to who desires the capacity to be pregnant to put the pieces together and think well you know if there's a sudden demand for uteruses you know in the in the interests of desire or even framed as a civil right um then where are they going to come from they're not they're not going to come from donors they're going to well at least some of them will come from donors but some of them most likely will arrive on the black market from from people who are forced by necessity to to turn themselves not just into the product and not just even not even just into the workplace but into the raw materials for the transhumanist and the incre- the incredible economic asymm- asymmetries of the transhumanist order okay and so you mary harrington like frodo want to carry the ring uh, all the way to the fires <laughs> of mount doom and destroy um a power that is dehumanizing us all to the to the point where you know towards the end of the book you're you're saying women come off come off the pill um i don't see any other i don't see any other way of starting it uh, the the pushback against the transhumanist revolution well if the if this is a revolution that started with women then women have to stop it you know women have to you know and it might not work you know just saying no we're not going to have the pill no we're going to occupy ourselves is only a start but i think it's a i think it's an important one you know the occupy wall street movement failed because it didn't realize just how far we needed to go I think before we can have an Occupy Wall Street movement, we need an Occupy Ourselves movement. And that that has to start with women. Yes. Yeah. Occupy your body and allow it to be the physical, fruitful, um, em- embodied, you know, I was about to say thing, but it's not a thing. <laughs> it's not a thing. It's It's us. We are our bodies. We are our bodies. And... I don't I and I think in the context of the cyborg era perhaps it was different in the industrial era where really the the, the contested the contested ma- topic was how much freedom and for whom now the now the now the contest is over how much embodiment and for whom and on what terms and and I don't think it's possible in that context to have a feminism which doesn't start from the premise premise that we are our bodies I don't think I don't think a so you know well, while while in a sense I don't believe in progress I do believe in looking about us and seeing where we are now and in and in trying to take a stand based on where we are now for what constitutes women's interests because those are as much as ever you know, under assault um yeah, as as technology marches on and I think it's it, it's a it's a great shame that the the artillery employed by feminism in the industrial era is now being turned against women in the cyborg era but I'm not without hope yeah, I think I think we stand a chance. We just have to we just have to occupy ourselves. Ah, you have hope, very, so you don't you don't I believe do. in progress, but you do have hope. And that's and and as we draw things to a close, I'd, I'd love to um, get your thoughts on this because there's all there's all sorts of constellations of ideas um, that have deep deep resonances, um, certainly with my Christian faith, in terms of okay, we we need to have a doctrine of a, a person, and it needs not to be led purely by the market. <laughs> Nor do I think that it doesn't need to be led purely by biology, um, because I'm, you know, if we are an ape-brained meat sack, I, I'm not sure why Elise can't dream transhumanist dreams in terms of if, if our biology is evolving in that sense. Perhaps, you know, as Yuval Noah Harari says, you know, we are evolving towards Homo Deus. Um, what is it that gives us our human nature? And I, I would say, you know, the, the image of God is a profound thing to kind of reflect on. Um, I think as C.S. Lewis talks about in The Abolition of Man, what we really need is, he calls it the Tao, um, you know, taking it from kind of Eastern philosophy, but he says, you know, it's not just a Western thing to believe in natural law. It's not just a Western thing to believe in the good, the true, and the beautiful. To have something supernatural above us um, that is the pole star by which we, we direct things. Um, it, it seems to me we, we need to have some kind of supernatural sense 
of the human and and for me god the human jesus christ is is the, the you know the ultimate grounding for my humanism i'm a christian humanist because of jesus in the change that you want to see mary um, do you think we need to have a, 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 a discussion and a conversation about these spiritual realities, these religious realities, these the profoundly Christian realities, in order to, to see the sorts of changes that, that you want to see? I do. Um, it's an open question for me how we go about that. Um, somebody, somebody else um, who, who's recently read my book and is responding to it from a Christian perspective accused me very, in, a very, in a very friendly way of trying to scale the north face of the Vatican in my book without, without any ropes or crampons. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in, in a sense, I'm trying to reverse engineer a whole, a whole slew of, um, of teachings which are articulated for fairly straightforwardly in Christianity and, and indeed in Catholic social teaching. I'm not actually a Roman Catholic. And if I've, if I've approached it from the angle that I've approached it from, it is because in my view, and really this is, this is more of a literary point than a theological one, you have to meet people where, you, where they are. Um, and in my experience, again, as a writer, um, if the moment, the moment you whip out St. Thomas Aquinas, you've, it's over. People will, people will just, you know, they're not listening anymore. Um, and that's, that, that may be, that, that may not be ideal from, certainly from, I imagine, from the point, your point of view as a Christian, uh, YouTuber. I can see that's very much suboptimal, but it, but it's where we are in terms of, in terms of the broader public conversation. And so what I've, you know, and I didn't set out to write, to, to just, to, to, to write a sort of oblique apologetics, you know, an apologetics by the back door. Um, I, I set out, I set out to write what I thought was true. Um, it just happens to tally <laughs> with, with some thing, with, with a great deal of stuff that a whole, a whole load of other people have, have also concluded was true from within a Christian framework. Um, how, how we, how we go about just sort of to, to come back to your broader point, um, addressing these larger questions is, well, I'll have a, I'll have a better answer for you on that in about ten years because this is you know answering that question is is straightforwardly my ten year project. You know how how can we find our way back to natural law whilst also meeting people where they are? Um, it's a it's an enormous question which takes in pretty much the entirety of the history of metaphysics for the last sort of two three thousand years, and so I have quite a lot of reading to do <laughs> before I have any kind of a useful contribution to make on that. But my hunch, um, or at least the avenue I'm following in terms of trying to trying to understand. You know how we could approach that is is that actually evolution is our friend, um, and the and natural history and the sciences are not poten- are, are potentially not our enemies in terms of finding our way back to natural law. Um, be- and particularly the one approach that I've taken um, in in trying to trying to trying to sort of delve into the, the question of how how we get from this very sort of dismantling um, objectifying. Um, under, understanding of nature, which is what we think of as usually propagated by the science, back to back back towards the the holistic, um, if you like, the spiritual understanding of of the natural order, which is explicitly excluded and rendered invisible by that paradigm. You know what what I suppose what Heidegger calls in framing. You know, seeing the world as in terms of how it can be exploited. Um, it, it renders all the things it renders invisible are the things that paradigm renders invisible are the, are the things which which the a, a more spiritual perspective would would understand as as the basic fabric of reality so you know how how we get from there to there is is it's a problem um, but but i think the path is via biosemiotics which is a very interesting and currently quite niche um interdisciplinary field which looks at looks at the natural world as systems of meaning making not as not as mechanistic Systems or hydraulics or mechanics, but as, as systems of meaning making that take place, you know, in infinite, infinite, infinite complexity over time, and in which human human meaning making is inextricably intertwined. Right, right. And and I think I, I can see I can see how <laughs> I, I I can I can I'm just gl- just at the edges of seeing how how you can get from there back towards some back towards the transcendent. Um, without, yeah, you know, and you know, I'll probably find that I've just reverse engineered something St. Thomas Aquinas said many hundreds of years ago. But or or John chapter one, which uh, I've already mentioned. <laughs> you know, the, in the beginning was the word, in the meaning, was the logos. Word. Just so, just so. Um, and, and through and the I, word, all things came. Yeah, yeah, 
And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, yeah. So, so I'm so I'm not without hope. I think I think we're at a we're, we've arrived at a very dark place, Glenn. And I expect us to be in that very dark place for probably most or pro- for probably my lifetime. But I think we have to take the long view. Ah, the long view. See, see that that's the way that I think Martin Luther King's statement is believable. If <clears> we believe that the arc of, of history is long, but it bends towards justice, if we think of it like a rainbow that sort of soars up and then lands in the in the in the distance with the pot of gold, nonsense. Um, but I think as the Christian preacher, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was quoting from uh, Parker a, a century earlier, um, it's, a, it's a prophetic hope that, that's, that the ark goes down. <laughs> like the, yeah. the, the way on is the way down. And what I loved about your book is just finishing with the local, finishing with the embodied, finishing with um, rediscovering marriage as covenant and not contracts and, and getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, and, and that kind of hunkering down. I don't know if you've, um, interacted much with Rod Dreher at Mm -hmm. all. I know, um, uh, Louise has just done a, a, a conversation with him, but again, I I see with him, there's a lot of pessimism about, about the short term, but, uh, yeah, there can be a profound hope. Um, it just depends which way the arc is going and and perhaps, (laughs) perhaps resurrection is coming that requires a death and that and this requires is a, this is probably a, yeah. a whole other conversation glenn but I, I i feel like we've arrived at a point where actually the way forward for people who retain a faith in jesus is probably not to fixate on the cross but to but to think more about the resurrection we should probably mm. talk about that another time but i i, I think this, we, we need if, if we're to have any hope at all it's not under the sign of crucifixion but of resurrection no. i love it i love it and uh in fact, I was just reading John 20 yesterday and thinking, uh, I wish I was called Mary because there, there, is, there is Jesus. There is Mary at the tomb kind of in a flap and he just says her name. How amazing to, to have the risen Jesus uh, proclaim the, her The name. moment that, I, that, comes, that haunts me, I suppose you could say, um, is, is where, where his, he, he meets his disciples on the road and they don't recognize him. There's something yeah. so eerie about that. That I think there's a there's a there's a whole mystery there that that we should talk more about. Yes, I'd love that. I'd love that. Mary Harrington, uh, your book is Feminism Against Progress. It's fantastic. It is uh, it is every bit like downing a packet of tank fastics after a lifetime of gruel, as Louise Perry says. And you'll get to read wonderful terms like cyborg theocracy and bio libertarianism and meat lego gnosticism and so much more. And I highly recommend it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Mary. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.